All right, we had begun studying about discipleship and we call this perfecting the saints. All right, if you turn with me in your Bibles, let's read to, uh, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 and we will read verses 11 and 12. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 and 12. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So the Bible says that God's purpose for his church is edification, perfection. The work of the ministry is what accomplishes this perfection and edification among the body of Christ and this we call of course discipleship and again as I've said in my previous Bible studies one of the most uh, serious uh, things that Christians ne uh, neglect in the church is discipleship the focus is always on evangelism which is good but evangelism and discipleship go hand in hand. You cannot neglect uh, one while you focus on the other. You have to win souls to Christ. That's your responsibility. But you cannot leave those souls that you win to the Lord and uh, say that, you know, now it's uh, your problem. You grow in the Lord. You do what you want. That's not how the Lord designed it to be. God wants Christians to lead souls to the Lord Jesus Christ and then help them grow. Of course, that's what the local church is for, right? But many times Christians think that discipleship and even evangelism for that matter is the work of the pastor. It's the work of the evangelist. It's not my work. That's the attitude many Christians have. So today we are going to talk about a vision for uh, evangelism and discipleship. That's what we need. That's what is lacking. A vision to engage in evangelism a vision to engage in discipleship so what we need to do is we need to get this vision from God let us look at a verse in Proverbs 29 which you probably are familiar with and if you're not you should memorize this verse Proverbs 29 and verse 18 where there is no vision the people perish and it goes on to say, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. But I want you to focus on these words. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Now, this is a perishing world. You cannot deny that. This world is perishing. There are lost people in this world, billions of them, dying and going to an eternity without Jesus Christ, where they will burn in a hell forever and ever and a hell whose flames will never be quenched isn't that sad we are living in a lost world a perishing world a world that is on its way to hell to burn there forever and ever and the cause for this the cause for this uh, world's perishing is not because it cannot be saved you see that it's not because it cannot be saved it's because God's people do not have a vision for this lost world. That's why. That's the reason why this world is perishing. It's because we, God's people, do not have a vision. And of course, we are living in this Laodicean church period where the church in general is lukewarm. Their most important priority is not their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not their walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. And because Christians neglect their relationship with God, they do not develop a vision for this world. That's the problem. Because you see, you cannot uh, develop this vision by yourself. You cannot think it and put it in your mind and say, this is my vision. That's not how it is. God gives that vision because this vision is not just something that you see or a plan that you have, but it's a vision uh, which is connected to having a burden for the lost. And you cannot develop that burden by yourself. God has to give that burden. God has to place it in our hearts. And the reason we don't have this vision, this burden for the lost and this perishing world 
is because we do not have a close walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what Jesus said uh, to his disciples, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, his main purpose for you would be to become a fisher of men. Like he said to Peter and the other disciples, from henceforth, you will be fishers of men. You will catch men, he said, if you follow me. So that tells you that most Christians are not following the Lord Jesus Christ, at least the way they ought to follow it. And that's the problem. And that's the reason why this world is perishing. Because Christians do not have a vision, a burden for the lost. Christians do not have a vision and a burden for the lost because they do not walk closely with the Lord Jesus Christ. When you walk closely with Jesus Christ, you see the burden of his heart and it burdens you. It burdens you. Like Paul said, woe is me. He said, if I do not preach the gospel, that would be the kind of compulsion that we would uh, feel inside of our own hearts when we walk closely with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as I've said, the reason why Christians do not have a vision, the reason why they lack this vision and burden is because they don't walk closely with the Lord Jesus Christ. And because they do not walk closely with him, because they don't make prayer and Bible study and reading a priority in their lives. Their focus is on temporal things. Their focus is not on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, in Hebrews 12, the Bible says, looking unto Jesus. That's how we need to, uh, you know, run in this race that is set before us in this world. We have to look unto Jesus, he says. But instead of looking unto Jesus... Our focus is on temporal things. And that is a big problem in the life of the Christian. Why is it that Christians do not engage in evangelism and discipleship? It's because their focus is on temporal things and not on eternal things. You see, in this study on discipleship, I have given this illustration of the wheel. I said the Christian's great commitment is to live in obedience to the great commander, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us the great commandment, which is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength, and has also given us the great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And we have seen that these two, two commandments, the great commandment and the great commission given by our great commander, the Lord Jesus Christ, can be understood in this way. This this line, the great commandment to love the Lord our God, is to do with our relationship with God, right? It's this vertical relationship that we have with God. How can we love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength? It's by spending time in prayer and reading and studying the Bible. That's the foundation. And we have said a few things about the Bible I have shown you an illustration of the Bible hand. If you have those five things, if you do those five things with your Bible, you'll have a good grip over it as a young Christian. And if you, we, have, we spoke a few things about prayer and we spoke about the prayer hand. And if you have those, at least those five things in your prayer life, your prayer life would be uh, a, a living, a vibrant prayer life with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the most important thing. And then you love your neighbor as yourself, then you obey the Great Commission, which has two parts to it, evangelism and discipleship. And living in obedience to this is the great commitment of the Christian, which is lacking. We also spoke about the great omission. The great omission to this great commandment and the great commission that the Lord Jesus Christ has given us. Isn't it? We are guilty of it. We are guilty of this great omission because we do not have a vision. Proverbs 29, 18. It's because we do not have a vision. And we do not have a vision because we do not walk with the Lord Jesus Christ and our focus is on temporal things. And now, the purpose of today's uh, 
study would be to bring our focus back on eternal things. That's how God wants it to be, right? He doesn't want our focus to be on uh, temporal things, the things of this world. Remember, the Bible says, this world passeth away and the things that are in the world, which is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. All these things will pass away. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. We have to focus on eternal things. And only then will we get our vision back. A vision for this world, a vision to engage in evangelism and also uh, on discipleship. So that's the first purpose, to bring our focus back to eternal things. And the second thing would be to help us to understand that the fulfilling of the Great Commission is every Christian's responsibility. Again, a lot of Christians do not engage in evangelism and discipleship because they do not believe, like I've said before, that it is their responsibility. They think it is the responsibility of the pastor, the evangelist, the deacon or somebody else. Maybe there are some of you watching who have been thinking in this manner, but you have to know that that's not what the Bible teaches. It's not somebody else's responsibility. It's your responsibility. It's my responsibility. So... Please keep this real illustration in your mind as we study the subject. I left it up there so that it would remind you of some of the most basic things that we need to keep in mind. So the twofold purpose, firstly remember that it is to help us bring our focus back on eternal things and secondly to help us understand that the fulfilling of the Great Commission is the responsibility of the Christian. Now, I want to talk briefly about eternal things. What are these eternal things that we should keep our focus on? Did you ever think about it? Most of the times, Christians, as I've said, focus on temporal things, the things that are in the world. They're always concerned about the mundane things. And they're worried about their lives, they're worried about so many things in spite of what Jesus Christ said, in spite of what the Bible says about all these things. Instead of looking unto Jesus, instead of focusing on eternal things, they look on temporal things. But did you ever consider what are those eternal things that you should keep your mind on, that you should have your heart fixed upon? Let me mention a few of those eternal things that the Bible talks about. Turn with me please to Psalm 102. Psalm 102, verses 25 to 27. Psalm 102, verses 25 to 27. Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish. You see, the earth is a temporal thing. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment, as a vesture shall thou change them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy ears shall have no end. Did you think about this any time? Eternal things. When we talk about eternal things, God is eternal. God is eternal. That means your mind, your heart, your eyes, your vision should be fixed upon God because God is eternal. Look at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 and 2. You see how the Bible differentiates between the eternal and the temporal. It says the earth and all that God has made are only temporal things. Colossians 3 1 and 2. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. The earth is temporary. Do not let your eyes be on the earth. Let your eyes be towards God and the Lord Jesus Christ.
I know that there is a big controversy raging right now among Bible believers. Not really among Bible believers, but there seem to be some one or two who have risen up to trouble the body of Christ, the body of Bible believers, and who try to show others that they are more intelligent than all the others. How do they do that? They go to the Bible and try to come up with a new interpretation for everything, especially when it comes to the triune uh, God that the Bible talks about. All right, so I, as I'm addressing young Christians here, I want you to keep this in mind. Do not get carried away by all these philosophical arguments about the nature of God and all that. You need to just focus on what the Bible says. They try to uh, make it look like Jesus Christ is a lesser God, a created God. It's heresy, really, if you deny the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Bible clearly shows us that Jesus Christ is God. He's called God manifest in the flesh. Right in John 1.1 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And this Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Right? So, Jesus Christ is God. If you teach some wrong doctrine in the Bible, as a Bible believer, it doesn't make you a heretic, you see. You're just mistaken about a doctrine. But when you make a mistake about the deity of Jesus Christ, you're denying the Lord Jesus Christ who has bought you, then you become a heretic. And that's what these people are, heretics, trying to confuse young Christians. All, of course, they have their arguments. They think they are very intelligent. You know, behind all those arguments that they come up with to show that Jesus Christ is not the same as God is self-righteousness and pride of intelligence. Knowledge puffeth up, right? That's exactly what there is. If you notice their arguments, if you notice their attitude in their teaching, that's what you find. A lot of self-righteousness and a lot of pride. And you have to be very careful about these people. They want to uh, show Christians, you know, that they know the Bible better than all the greatest Bible teachers who have ever lived in the past 2000 years. So they make it look like Jesus Christ is a lesser God, right? That he was a created God and all that. Their ministry really, you know, we are talking about developing a vision for the world, right? A vision to evangelize and disciple people. And what is it that we do in order to evangelize and disciple people? We talk about our great commander, the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And we say that he is God manifest in the flesh who came down to this world and laid down his life for our sins. He became the sacrifice for our sins. He shed his blood to atone for our sins. He was buried and rose up again the third day. We preach that. The mission of these people who are saying Jesus, Christ is not God is to proclaim to the world that you're all mistaken all of you Christians are mistaken Jesus Christ is not God God has commissioned these people to go and spread this great good news Jesus Christ is not God or at least he's not equal to God he's not of the same sense of God that's their message to the world isn't it sad? It's very sad. But that's how it is. But you must know that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. He is equal with God and thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And he came down to this world as a man. Your focus should be on God. He is eternal. Your focus should be on Jesus Christ. He is eternal. Not only is he eternal in the sense that in the future he will be there forever, but he is eternal in the sense that he's always been there, just like God. In eternity past, he was there, and he will be there in eternity future. If you can use these words to describe eternity. Right? So he is nothing less than God, and your eyes, your focus should be on your Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ. God and the Lord Jesus Christ are eternal. Of course, the Holy Spirit is eternal. 
I'm not at all hesitant or ashamed to use the word Trinity. I don't care if the Roman Catholic Church has coined that word, really. The people who fight over that word are silly babies. That's what they are. I don't care if the Roman Catholic Church... You know what many Christians think? They think the doctrine of the Trinity has been created by the Catholic Church. Well, yes, it was ratified probably in the, you know, in the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. Probably the Catholic Church was behind it. I don't care. Because you see, my King James Bible confirms that truth to me. James Bible confirms this great truth to me, so I don't care. I don't care if the Catholic Church came up with the doctrine of Trinity or the Mormon Church came up with the doctrine of Trinity or the Jehovah's Witnesses or Hindus or Muslims. I don't care who came up with the doctrine of Trinity. Because you see, the thing is, I find it in my King James Bible and I believe it. The three persons of the Godhead. The three persons of the Godhead. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit and God the Father together form the Godhead and I don't mind calling the Godhead the Trinity. <laughs> Alright, you can go ahead and criticize me as much as you like, I don't care about that. But you see the Godhead is eternal and your eyes, your focus must be on the Godhead, on God the Father, the God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. I know my internet is stuck. There's nothing I can do. I'm just going to go forward and teach. And let's see what's going to come out of this. Secondly, and very, very important for you. Because you see, when we say that your eyes should be on God, the Father, God, the Son and God, the Holy Spirit. We are talking about somebody that you cannot see with your literal eyes, right? Whom having not seen, we believed, right? So we can only look at the Godhead with our spiritual eyes, by faith. Not with our literal eyes. We cannot see them with our literal eyes. So there is a problem, you see. Because for us, what we cannot see is very difficult for us to believe. So when in times of need, in times of trouble, trials, afflictions... It's difficult to look at God or the Lord Jesus Christ or the Holy Spirit whom you cannot see with your eyes. That's why God gave us his perfect word. His perfect word, the Holy Scriptures. God's word is eternal. Okay, we are talking about eternal things. God is eternal. God's word is eternal. God's word is eternal. We are talking about the written scriptures. The written scriptures. I think we have already said enough about what we believe about the King James Bible. When we talk about the written, the written scriptures in this church age, in these last days before the rapture of the church, we are talking about the King James Bible. Alright, we are talking about the King James Bible. Because that is God's inspired uh, preserved. Words of God, they are infallible. They are inerrant. They are infallible, they are inerrant. They cannot make any mistake. There are no mistakes in the King James Bible. And God's word is eternal. Look at Mark chapter 13 and verse 31. I'm sure you have this memorized. Mark chapter 13 and verse 31.
and ye shall be hated of all I'm sorry Mark 13 31 heaven and earth shall pass away but my words shall not pass away you see the very important thing to note is words plural not just word like some people believe that you know the word of God is inspired but you ask them well so are you saying that every word in this book is without any mistakes they say no 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 the, the word of God <laughs> you know that's the kind of uh, people you face among Christians but the words are important God just didn't preserve his word he preserved his words Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words, plural, shall not pass away. This book is the word of God. This book is the word of God. But you see, this book, which is the word of God, contains the words of God. This book contains the words of God. Look at Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7, the promise that God gave to preserve his words of course has been changed in every single English Bible version on the face of the earth I think if I'm not mistaken every single one maybe one or two has not I, I'm not aware of that but as far as I know every single Bible on earth has changed these words that are found in the King James Bible Psalm 12 6 and 7 the words plural of the Lord are pure words you see that as silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times thou shall keep them O Lord thou shall preserve them from this generation forever the words you see the extent of preservation is not just some mythical word of God it is the words every word that God spoke through his servants and the Lord willing, you know, we uh, are going to talk a little bit more later about the Bible and prayer in a little bit more detail. And when we do that, the Lord willing, we will talk about the inspiration of the scriptures. We'll talk about the preservation of the scriptures. Okay, so when we do that, we will talk a little bit more about that. But now I want you to see that God is eternal. God's word is eternal and God's word consists of words. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So please keep that in mind. Please keep that in mind. These are the eternal things that our minds, our focus should be on. Right, then, thirdly, the souls of men, the souls of men are eternal. And that's something we forget. We are all mindful of this fact. God is eternal. God's word is eternal. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. That's very fine. But souls are also eternal and we tend to forget that. We always tend to forget that. You must understand that the souls of all men go to one of two places. Either to this or that place. And those two places are heaven and Or hell those are the only two places where the uh, the souls of people go to and both heaven and hell are eternal both heaven and hell are eternal uh, the present heaven of course will pass away but when we talk about the present heaven we are talking about the second heaven but heaven God's dwelling place shall never pass away hell Remember Jesus said where the fire is never quenched and the worm never dies. The only thing is hell is changed into another uh, place called the, the, the lake of fire after the thousand year reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the burning of the souls will be forever whether it's in hell or in the lake of fire. It's the same. The flames are the same. That's where the inhabitants of hell are transferred to, the lake of fire. 
after the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there they will burn forever and ever and ever. If, of course, they reject the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, if they reject Jesus Christ as their Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ came down, who is God manifest in the flesh, came down to this world to die for your sins, to bear the punishment for your sins, to make a blood atonement for your sins. Because you're a sinner. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. If you die in your sins, you will go to hell or the lake of fire where you will burn forever and ever. Your soul will be there forever. Isn't that a horrible thing? Yes, it is. You would not wish your worst enemies to go to this place. Because there is no escaping this place. That's where you will burn forever and ever. But if you trust the blood atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ for your sins, if you believe that he died for your sins, he was buried and rose up again the third day according to the scriptures, you will be saved. The Bible says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Right? If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It's simple. You must believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and rose up again. That he did it for you personally. And then your soul would go to this place called heaven where you will live forever and ever. Your soul is eternal and the place where your soul would go to is eternal. So what am I trying to say? Your focus should be on God through the scriptures which are both eternal. And when you do that, you will also be able to keep your focus on the souls of men and women. Especially the souls of those who are lost and dying and ready to go to hell. You want to snatch them out of the fire. But that's not the end because you see even after you snatch them out of fire, it is still your responsibility to take care of those eternal souls and feed them and help them uh, to, to grow and be fit for heaven. Not that they won't go to heaven if they are not fit. I'm not saying that. Your salvation is secure once you're saved. You're saved forever. But you see, if you are discipled here, if you disciple those souls that you have led to the Lord Jesus Christ, and they grow, then the quality of life in heaven that they would have would be much better than otherwise. Look at a few verses. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 and 17. It says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. If you are a born again Christian and if you die before the rapture, you will be raised back to life when Jesus comes into midair for the church. Then, verse 17, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we uh, ever be with the Lord. We shall be with the Lord forever and ever. Our souls are not going to be annihilated like some people teach. That's blasphemy. They teach that, you know, all this nonsense that they come up with, unbiblical, unscriptural nonsense. I find a lot of them writing these things in the comments on our videos. Well, uh, I never have the time to respond to those things. It'll be good if some of you who know the scriptures well would respond to such people who write and say, hell or uh, is the grave or something like that. You know, like some of these skulls teach. They say, if you die, you go to the grave. That's the end. You don't go to heaven. You don't go to hell. Your soul is annihilated. The last destination of the human being is the grave. They even go ahead and say that Jesus went to the grave. He did not descend into the lower parts of the earth. For them, the, the grave is the lower parts of the earth. So they get all confused. That's because they don't believe the scriptures as they are. They try to come up with interpretations or they get swayed by the opinions of men. That's the thing. But you see, 
The Bible says that your, that your body will go to the grave. Your spirit goes back to God. But your soul, you see, that part of you which you say, I, your ego as it's called, right? You will either go to heaven or hell. And if you are in Christ, you will go to heaven where your soul will be with him forever and, uh, and ever. And another beautiful thing about it is you even get a body at the rapture, a glorified body. A body that can never die again. A body that can never be affected by disease or sickness. It can never sin. It can never cause you to go astray from God. A glorified body like the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Like Paul talks about it in Philippians, I think, 3, 20, 21 in that area. Right? So that's where you're going to live eternally if you're in Christ. And so remember... These precious souls that you lead to the Lord Jesus Christ should be discipled and made ready for heaven. That's your responsibility. They're going to heaven. But that's not all. Like I've said, if you are outside of Jesus Christ, then you go to a place called hell. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We'll read verses 7 to 10. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 7 to 10. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day now again there are some false teachers who say that there is no place called hell or hell is at least not a literal place where you burn in a literal flame they say hell is just separation from god of course they would look at these words it says who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the lord so it's just a separation from the presence of god no you will be destroyed Destruction doesn't mean annihilation in the Bible. Go read the word every time it occurs in the Bible. Destruction is not annihilation every time. God can destroy you in hell in the sense that he can make you suffer and you will be afflicted in hell forever. Remember in Luke chapter 16 you have the, par uh, the, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And they go to a literal place called paradise that is Lazarus. And the rich man goes to a literal place called hell under the earth. We have made a Bible study on uh, the topic called what's under the earth. You can go and check it out to see what the Bible says about the nether parts of the world or the lower parts of the world. For you to get a clear understanding. So that's how it is. That soul goes to hell and that soul burns there forever and ever and ever. There are numerous verses in the Bible which talk about hell and how a soul will burn there forever. That's why it's important for you to engage in evangelism. Do you see? If your focus is on eternal things, your focus would be on God, the triune God. Then if your uh, focus is on eternal things, your focus would be on the words of God, the word of God which consists of the words of God and if your focus is on eternal things then your focus your mind your heart would be burdened for souls to win them to the Lord Jesus Christ and then to disciple them winning them to the Lord Jesus Christ you deliver them from hell from the lake of fire discipling them you make them fit for heaven and that's what we are called to do as Christians now let me show you something okay before that probably uh, look at a verse in the Gospel of John Gospel of John chapter 6 John chapter 6 verse 27 John chapter 6 verse 27 Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat 
which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Do not work or do not labor for meat which perisheth, temporal things, but for meat which endureth unto everlasting life, eternal things. Work, labor for eternal things. That means you have a good relationship with God through prayer and the word of God. And once that is in place, God will give you a vision for this world. He will give you a vision for the lost souls to win them to Christ for evangelism. He will give you a vision to disciple them and make them ready for heaven to receive great rewards in heaven. Now I want to illustrate the brevity of our lives. All right, the brevity of our lives by uh, making use of this timeline that we always make use of. But firstly, turn with me to the book of James. The book of James. We'll probably close with this illustration. James chapter 4. James chapter 4. Let's read uh, verses 13 through 16. Verses 13 through 16. I'm sure you're familiar with these uh, verses, with this passage. You should um, memorize uh, some of these verses because they'll help you in witnessing. James chapter 4 verses 13 through 16. Go to now ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Temporal things. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life, your temporal life, this physical life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Memorize this verse. What is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For, for that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that, but now... Ye rejoice in your boastings, all such rejoicing is evil. Okay, the Bible is very clear about the brevity of the human life. It's very short, right? I think that's a, a very beautiful outline to preach the gospel that some people use, which has James 4.14 as a part of it. Life is short, death is sure, sin the cause, Christ the cure, right? Something like that, that that's a beautiful way to... Uh, witness to someone or preach the gospel. That's a good outline to preach on the streets as well. But you see that these are eternal things. Our focus should be on those things because your life itself is so short in this world. It is a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. That's why Moses says, teach us to number our days. Teach us to number our days, the Bible says. And that's what most Christians don't do. When I say, when the Bible says, teach us to number our days, it doesn't mean you sit down and start counting. Well, a great Bible scholar in the 19th uh, or 20th century, I guess, no, 19th century, Robert Dick Wilson actually did that. You know what he did? He sat down and he tried to calculate uh, approximately how long he might live on this earth. How did he do that? He looked at his forefathers and saw how many years they lived. And based on that, he's got some calculations for that. He removed a few years because each generation, the lifespan according to him is shortened. Supposedly, not every time probably, but sometimes. But he was able to calculate almost accurately. I think uh, according to his calculation, he would live some 80 years or 90. I'm not very sure now. I, I don't forget the exact, I mean, I don't remember uh, the exact details, but he was pretty accurate. And you know what he did? He divided his life. He divided his life into parts. And he said, this first part, I'm going to prepare myself for the ministry. The second part, I'm going to do this. This third, last part of my life, this is what I'm going to do. And he was one of... Uh, the greatest champions of the Hebrew Masoretic text, which underlies the, the text of the King James Bible. 
and I think he was an expert in 40 languages, expert. He was not just acquainted with 40 languages, he was an expert in 40 uh, languages that were, that are connected to the Hebrew language, the cognate languages. And he was able to study all these languages and prove that the Masoretic text underlying the King James Bible is indeed the preserved word of God in the Hebrew language. So, I uh, just wanted to put that in. So it's possible for us to number our days or at least prayerfully consider and ask God to help you to plan your life. Your life is very short in this world. It is as a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. I want you to think of it. I want you to think of your place in this world, right? Around, I don't know if you can see the whole thing here. 4004 BC, God made Adam. Right? God made Adam. And then, of course, we have the patriarchs. I'm not talking about the patriarchs of Israel. I'm talking about the patriarchs who were there in the world that existed before uh, the flood in the days of Noah. Now, from the time of Adam to Noah is about 1600 years. Of course, if you go to uh, Bishop Usher's chronology, you would even, I think he says it's 600 and 1651 years, if I'm not mistaken. But all right, so let's say around 1600 years from Adam to Noah. Remember all the patriarchs who lived between them? Each one lived almost a thousand years. Almost a thousand years. 1600 years till the time of Noah. Let's say this is Noah in the time of the flood. And this is the ship or the ark of Noah. Around 1650 years. Noah was about 500 years I think at the time of the flood. And after the flood uh, he lived about or 600 years and then he lived about 300 years after that. Or 350 years. So you have this time period 1600 years. Can you believe that 1600 years were just over like that from Adam to Noah? Just like that. And how many chapters did the Bible dedicate for these 1600 years? Five chapters or six chapters at the most. That's all. 1600 years covered in six chapters in the Bible. And then of course you have uh, the other patriarchs. You have after Noah, you have Abraham. Who lived a long life, more than 100 years, right? You have Abraham and of course you have Isaac, you have Jacob, all of them lived more than 100 years and their lives are all there in the book of Genesis and the book of Genesis ends with Joseph, right? In chapter 50, Genesis chapter 50. And here is Genesis 1. So from Genesis chapter 1 to Genesis chapter 50, you have the lives of all these great men of God and how God dealt with them. From Adam to Joseph, it's 2,369 years. From Adam to Joseph, 2,000 369 years. In how many chapters did, you know, does God cover? 2,369 years. 50 chapters, that's it. Did you ever think about this? That the 50 chapters of Genesis cover a time period of 2,369 years. That is more than the church age. More than the church age. Only the first 50 chapters of Genesis. Think about it. Then, uh, of course, you have Moses, 
you have David and all the other great uh, men and women that God had chosen. But the thing is, from Genesis, when you come to the time of Malachi, from Genesis to Malachi, it's about uh, not 4,000 years, but it's about 3,607 years. 3,607 years. That is from Genesis to Malachi. From Genesis to Malachi, it is 3,607 years. And then you have the silent years, right? That's about 400, about 400 years. I'm not being accurate here. About 400 years, which are called the silent years. So altogether, 4,000 years of the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi or from Genesis to John the Baptist, let us say, or Genesis to Jesus Christ, the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, 4,000 years. Did you ever think how long 4,000 years would be? 4,000 years. And then we have the Lord Jesus Christ. And we call it AD, right? After, this is all BC. You start with 1 BC and go back to 4004 BC. But uh, when it comes to AD, Anno Domino, that is the year of the Lord. It is, you start with one and go on and we believe that about 30 AD the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified and was buried and rose up again around 30 AD. Born around 4 BC. All right, so 4,000 years of the, Old, uh, of the Old Testament and then you have about 2,000 years of the New Testament. Okay, we are now here in the church age. We are here in the church age. And today we are in the year 2021, right? But we are not sure about the exact date. We don't know if it's 2021 years, less than that, more than that. But let's just go with that. We are in 2021. 2000 years, 2021 years have gone by in this church age after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Think about it. 2000 years. Seven church periods are there in these 2,000 years. Seven church periods. And we are living here in the Laodicean church, is the last one. We are in the Laodicean church age. And you know, in, it's like, so now, till now, it's 6,000 years of history of this world. 6,000 years. This is, let's say, approximately 2,000 years. 2,000 years. And do you know what your life is in all this? Did you ever think about it? Did you ever think about your life? What does the Bible say about your life? It says, it is, a vapor, it is like a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then it vanisheth away. Let me remove this and put it in such a way that you'll get the right understanding of what I'm trying to say. You see, your life in 6,000 years of history, now can you see that it's, it would be like a vapor? If you have to put all the people who lived, right, on the earth in the last 6,000 years and their lives, each would have lived at least 70 years, some less, some more of course, but but according to the Bible, the average age of man is 70 years. So think about it. How would your life appear in these 6,000 years? Wouldn't it be like a vapor? Really, it would be like a vapor. Let me illustrate it in this manner. What is this? This point is when you came into this world. Okay, let me put it like this. 
This point is when you came into this world. Let's say it's your birth. That, that point. You were born. And then of course you grew up. And one day you got saved. One day you got saved. You're born again. Now you're living for the Lord Jesus Christ. This is where you are today. Your life today. Okay, this is where your life is today. And the next great event in your life, if the Lord tarries, would be your death. Your life is as a vapor, a little point. I cannot even put that little point there, really, because your life is so small. Your life is so small. Of course, the average life is 70 years. So let us say you live 70 years. Even if you don't die and the rapture takes place, let us say in your lifetime, in our lifetimes, still that would be the end of your life here on the earth. It would be the end of the earth. This is the rapture of the church. This is the second advent, if you're not familiar with this. The second coming of Jesus Christ. So this would be the tribulation. Do you see the brevity of your life when you look at the big picture? When you look at the big picture, do you see this? So many people have come and gone before you. And many will come after you. But your life is just like a little dot on this timeline. It will not even appear as a dot, but in order for us to understand, I put that little dot there. That's how brief our life is here on the earth. It's like a vapor that appeared for a little time, then it's gone. It's gone. It's just one little point. If you think of 70 years, maybe you think, oh, I have such a long time. I'm 20 years old now, so I have like... 50 more years. But those 70 years like, are like a drop in an ocean when you look at the big picture. Your life is very, very short. Think about it. People like Adam lived almost 1,000 years. Methuselah was the longest living person in history, almost 1,000 years. What happened? It's just over. His life is summarized in just a couple of verses, two or three verses, that's all. Thousand years of life and we live just 70 years. Why am I saying all this? In order for you to get the right perspective of life. Life is short. Life is very short. It is like a vapor that appeareth for a little while and then vanisheth away. Your temporal life is so short. You see, life is so short and yet we focus on the temporal things of this life. Correct? Instead of focusing on the eternal things which would last eternally. Where, you know, these are the things that you will have to do with forever in eternity. The Godhead, the Word of God and the souls of people. These are the things that you would live with forever and ever and ever. But the things that you're focusing on are things which will just vanish away, just like your life. They're all temporal. I got thinking about my life when I was sick the last month. I thought it's so easy. It's so easy. We could just die. We are fine one day. The next day we could be dead. The next minute we could be dead, right? It's not like God needs us. Don't ever be under that delusion. God doesn't need anybody. He uses us for his glory. And that's a great honor for us. That he even considers using such unworthy people as we are. So don't think God needs me so he's going to keep me alive. No, nobody is indispensable. A life is like a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. It's temporal. That's why our focus should be on eternal things. Alright, we have...